All right. Hi, welcome everybody um, back to our next session here at Managing Editor Live. I'm Mary Ellen Slater. I'm the CEO and founder of RepCap and the publisher of Managing Editor. And I am one of your hosts today with my co-host Tom Anderson, who you just saw um, wrapping up with Kelly Butler. So up here next, we actually have, um, I guess I'm very excited about it's Kristen Griffin, who is going to be presenting on, um, it's called, I call it the time inside out. Um, one of the things that they, that she and her team at Aon do that I have always been impressed with. I think I mentioned this this morning when I first met them, I assumed that they must have like a team of like 20 people putting out all the content that they put out. And then I got in there and discovered that it was like, Kristen. <laughs> like, Kristen is 20 people. No, there were a couple of, couple of other folks too, but they were just so efficient and the content was so cool that I, I almost still don't believe like how, how great it was. So I'm very excited to have her come here. Um, quick introduction. She's just senior content manager of con uh, senior. I'm going to start over. Senior Manager of Content Marketing at Aon. Um, like me and Tom, she was a reporter in a previous life. She worked in a variety of roles um, as a journalist before going to content marketing. And at Aon, um, the content that she, that she manages, you know, it comes to human capital, a lot of writing and editing and the data visualization part, which I think is part of what we're going to chat about here today. And she's, one of the things I love about her, she's really passionate about telling stories and figuring out how to use that data and use the the customer stories and so sort of bringing it all together into a really high impact way. And honestly, nobody does this like she does it. And so I'm really honored to have her come here and join us today. And she's going to take us behind the scenes in how they do this, how they use their data to tell stories. So with that, with that Kristen, I'm going to let you take it from here. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Mary, Mary Ellen and team for the invitation to speak here today about a topic that um, I'm excited about. It's something that's been reflected in my career. Um, and uh, so I'm going to take you through some of the things that I've learned in both being a journalist um, and in content marketing and using data, but I'm certainly no expert. Um, I have some things that I've learned along the way, but I would, I would love to hear from you all on comments, feedback, your own experience in this area, because I think we can all learn from each other. Um, that's what I love about these conferences where we get to spend some time to just kind of focus on what have we learned, slow down a little, share and collaborate. So I hope that we can do that at the end of the session. All right. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and talk about, you know, when I think about um, how to use data to tell a story um, in any kind of form, I think the first step is really understanding your data. Um, and this can be, I mean, the, the title of the session is using your proprietary data, but I think it can also apply to any time you're writing a story or uh, looking at um, some type of data sheet infographic, right? How can we supplement that with data, whether it's public data coming from another firm or inside your own firm? Um, and I apologize, I'm going to say the word data like a million times today, but um, there's really no better substitute, I think, for, for what we're talking about. So data can be intimidating, but it certainly doesn't have to be. Um, I, I think this chart below, it comes from Nate Silver's 538 website. So maybe if you're visiting that website, this kind of a chart makes sense to you. You can really dive into it. But I think for most of us uh, and for the audience that we're speaking to, putting something like this out there uh, would be would turn people off, right? I mean, what are we looking at here? Uh, and I think that's kind of a common mistake that people make when they look at data is let's include it all, or let's just rely completely on the experts. They give us a chart. Okay, I'm gonna trust you that this is saying what it needs to say, and I'll just include it in this uh, piece of content. And I, and I think that's a common mistake. So you really need to understand what is your data saying? Um, because if you can't explain that to your audience, then you're not going to really be able to effectively convey the message. And I'll say that um, I've had this in my own experience at Aon, where I think I understand some complicated data analysis and what we're trying to say. But then when I'm asked, you know, maybe my boss is like, well, can you explain this to me? Because I don't understand it. And I'll say, yeah, sure. And then I'll, I'll start talking about it. And I'll be like, you know, I'm actually I'm not sure. <laughs> on this area. Uh, maybe I need to go back and ask this question and this question, but I thought I understood it better, right? So I think, um, and that's okay, that's part of the process before we hit publish, is really making sure that we can understand it. 
And that doesn't mean that we're an expert in that field. I think part of it is knowing what you don't know. And um, so how do you simplify that to tell, to tell an effective story? So let's talk about that. What kind of data tells the best story? Um, there were some things that, that came to mind when I asked myself that. Um, what can bring your message more credibility? And I think that actually is the core goal of using data to in your content marketing is really bringing your story more credibility. Um, there are a few cases where providing some data points, it doesn't have to be um, the feature of the content piece, but at least providing some data points there, I think there are a few cases where that won't add more credibility if you're using the right ones. Um, what kind of data is your organization good at? And again, assuming that your organization has proprietary in-house data, and if it doesn't, that's okay, but what kind of data will then is the right type of information to gather from the outside. Um, but, you know, in the case of Aon, I mean, we have an incredible amount of, at least in the human capital business alone, workforce compensation data. Um, but, you know, what is the most effective type of data to include for this particular story? Um, because you don't want to throw everything in the kitchen sink at people. And what is your firm's value proposition? Again, if you don't have in-house data, what kind of credible sources can enhance your message? Um, you know, your value proposition, I think it goes back to each individual piece of content, like what sets your firm apart in telling this story um, and then what kind of data can supplement it. I mean, I'll give an example. This year we looked at producing a series of point of view papers on um, that really tied into our campaigns for the year for the human capital business. And one of those is, was, um, you know, how can you drive positive change on diversity, equity, and inclusion within your workforce? And there are probably um, thousands, if not more of um, similar point of view papers out there, right? So we really had to ask ourselves, if we wanna be talking about this, which we're passionate about, we believe in, and we think we can help companies on this, what sets us, what sets Aon apart? What is your value proposition? And then from that, then take the next step to ask what kind of data supports that. All right, so one of the goals of using data is really to become interesting, credible, approachable, attract a following, right? And how do we how do we do that? So I think there were three lessons that I have, um, you know, I've come up with through my own experience. Again, would love to hear from others as well. Um, the first is that you really need to, and this applies to any type of content, but I think it's important when you're using data because it can quickly bog down a piece of content and maybe make it overly technical if you're not careful. So really answer the question up front is, um, you know, why does somebody care? And you need to answer that right away. Um, and I think with information data, you need to keep in mind that, um, you may be living in the story. Um, you may be living in the data. You may have spent a couple hours talking to your experts about what the analysis meant, but then you need to take that next step to keep in mind that others did not spend that time. And so then your job is to translate that information and make it actionable to like, why, why do they care? Why are they going to invest time spending, um, you know, reading this piece of content, looking at this piece of content, if I'm not going to tell them right away what I'm going to do to, to help them, why they should care. The second lesson is um, just because you might explain your story using data in a more elementary way doesn't mean your insights will only appeal to a second grader. And I can vouch for that because I have a second grader um, and I will try to explain in a more elementary way um, something I'm working on or even just like, what does my company do? And it's it doesn't really appeal to her. Um, and that's not the goal with our content marketing. We want to be concise, straightforward, reduce the jargon, um, don't create flowery sentences, right? Just good, solid writing. And I think that also needs to be conveyed with your data is um, understand it and know what you should include and what you shouldn't include. And I think that exclusion piece is actually just as important as, as um what to include because you know i might meet with our um 
data experts, you know, maybe our, our folks in the analytics department, and they can say, we did this really interesting analysis, we want to include it all, it's all so relevant. And that's just going to overwhelm your audience, even if your audience is people who are, you know, live and breathe data. Um, so I think it's, it's knowing how to tell that story. And maybe it's that the analysis can be broken up into five different content pieces, a whole series. But um, in general, if you have a piece of content that's including a decent amount of data, I think you need to um, make sure that it's easily understandable and it isn't going to turn somebody off because you're trying to sound too smart, too sophisticated. Um, the third lesson, and this is really, again, something that can apply to our role in content marketing is know your target audience and focus on what they care about. Um, and again, this can kind of come up when you do have a, a deep <clears throat> analysis where there are a lot of different elements to it. Um, consider breaking it into pieces. Or just saying, you know what? Yeah, that's an interesting tangent. Let's save that for something else. It's not, um, it's not core to this piece of content. Find your sweet spot. And this is really, I think, an important component of when you have proprietary data is find that balance in not oversharing, but sharing enough to tell a good story. Um, this is something that I've encountered throughout my career, not just at Aon, but even as a journalist, uh, is, um, you know, if you're, there's a tendency, I think, by a lot of businesses, if you're going to sell data that you should not give any of it away for free, why would you? Um, and I, I think that's a, a false assumption because I do think you need to give some of it away to make yourself interesting, right? It's not good enough to just say we have the best data out there, prove it. And tell good stories by sharing some of that. And then people will come back for more. Um, how do you find that right balance? I mean, I think it really just depends on what kind of information you're working with, um, your business's appetite for sharing that. But I do think that you need to give some of that away to tell a good story. And I'll give an example later um, on how we have approached that with our compensation data. So your goal is to build trust and loyalty with your audience. And the best way to do that is to tell great stories supported by facts, um, not opinions, but you know they may be opinions, but if they're supported by facts, then they're more credible. Um, I think in an environment where you know trust is low in companies, disinformation is everywhere, we have a unique opportunity to stand out with our content marketing as a trusted source, making incorporating data even more important. Um, all right. So let me get into some examples, uh, cause I think that's one way to really kind of drive home some of these, um, some of these lessons. I'm actually going to jump because I mentioned, I'm going to jump to this example of this chart. I mentioned striking the right balance <clears throat> and this chart isn't necessarily the prettiest chart in the world, but I think it actually, it gives a good example of how we approach this in one area of our data at Aon. So um, one of the things that we have in the human capital business is a deep um, level, a, a data platform where we collect compensation and other information, but primarily compensation data from companies so they can um, benchmark, know what to pay and also solve problems like are we paying pe people for, um, you know, equitably? Um, do we have gender pay gaps or other problematic pay practices? Um, are we setting our promotion budget? at a realistic level, things like that. And so when we think about um, wanting to share some of that information um, to talk about different trends. So this chart, I don't know how easily you can read it, but it says regional differentials in pay for the UK technology sector, kind of a mouthful. But basically we were looking at, um, you know, in the UK, just like in the US, you have certain hubs, particularly London, where they pay a premium for talent. It's more expensive to live there. Therefore, the cost of labor is higher. Um, so we set that that um, London at 0%. That's kind of the baseline for this chart. And then we looked at, I don't know, 17, 18 different regions throughout the UK to say, how do they compare to London? And so that was one way we looked at it versus saying, here's the actual median salary for a technology worker in London. Because there's so many qualifiers that come with that. Like how many companies are you looking at? What is the level of that 
that median employee. Um, what is the actual job? Are they a software engineer or an IT specialist? Um, so there's just so many qualifiers that come with it. And we didn't want to put that out there. That would be oversharing in our opinion. So this is, you know, showing percentages is a way where you can kind of find that right balance of telling a good story. We're giving a little bit away. We have something to say here, but we're not going to give you everything because for various reasons, right? Um, so I, I thought that example would be a good way of saying, you know, find your sweet spot, figure out what you're willing to share and what you want to hold back on. Um, let me turn back to this example. This is actually, it's funny, I realized as I was um, looking at this presentation that I included two UK technology examples. We do talk about other regions and um, industries, but uh, this was actually a, just a snippet of an article that we recently published. Um, so this isn't the full thing. As you see, it says key finding number two. But um, just to give you an example of something where there is a lot of information, and I think an easy way to distill it and make it digestible is to break it into um, key findings or subheads or, or break it apart into something that it still needs to weave together a story. Um, you need to tee it up, you need to tie it together at the end. And, um, you know, they need to connect somehow. But I think that it takes the onus off of having to make it um, throw everything out there that you did and that you can just pull apart little pieces of it and say, you know, this is an interesting finding. It kind of supports our hypothesis. This is another interesting finding. We're not going to include everything that we found. Um, and it makes it a lot easier for the reader to scan it and say like, oh, I got the, the headline. I'm interested in this piece. I'm going to read a little bit more. Or I'm going to analyze this chart. And then maybe the next key finding isn't as relevant and that's okay. So I think just breaking it into pieces, but also making sure that they are cohesive and tell a story. Um, these examples actually all come from a recent Pulse survey we did of around 14, 1500 people, individuals globally. Uh, we started in March of 2020 up until May of 2021, we conducted seven Pulse surveys of this nature, um, talking about how are you responding to the pandemic? And it's an enormous amount of data. We were talking about very high participation levels. Um, and the turnaround time is so quick. I mean, the, the surveys were out for about 10 days and then we had a operational, um, we had operationalized getting the results and putting it out into um, a report, an interactive report within three to five days. And as a marketing team, we we're figuring out how do we promote these results? How do we talk about that when it's such a rapid fire um, succession and you have so much information there. Um, the one in May 2021 was um, gave us a little bit of breathing room because companies were kind of responding. It wasn't so reactionary by that point in time as it was back in May, you know, up until um, more recently, you know, the end of 2022. At this point, it was really looking at, OK, how are you reshaping your business? How are you um, recovering? not necessarily just responding to um, the pandemic. And so when we looked at the information, we kind of um, looked at it from a what is our call to action, which is not the same, we realized, for every um, type of, of question that we asked or even categories of questions we asked. So giving an example of the, the main um, chart you see here on vaccination efforts, we put this into a simple one-page infographic. And for us, this is one of the early pieces of content we produced because we didn't really have to think a whole lot about the call to action. In this case, our human capital team, um, we don't have solutions around vaccinations and how companies should approach it. Um, you know, our health team does, but it was really just collecting this information to help companies have the intel they needed to respond quickly to changing conditions. And in this case, our call to action was um, we're trying to help our clients and you can download the full result results here and they fill out a form. We capture their information um, and it was just getting that out there as quickly as possible. Some of the other uh, types of questions are more, how are you reshaping the bus your business? Um, how are you focusing on 
total rewards, employee well-being, attracting talent, that sort of thing. So um, on the right-hand side, uh, we put together, this is just a little snippet of a flip book we put together for LinkedIn, where we compared the latest results to the last survey a few months prior to that and did a little bit more analysis. And the call to action was um, contact us for you know solutions around these areas. And then the bottom is we, we um, really three months, four months after the survey came out, found that it still had shelf life. And we put together a short 90 second video that really captured um, how are you? The main question is, how are you implementing the future of work? So it was more high level questions, things that are evergreen that companies are still going through. So um, those are just examples of how you can take a ton of survey information <clears throat> and really think about it by what is your call to action? Because um, it may not be the same for every piece of content. And um, with that, I am going to turn it back over to Mary Ellen and see if you guys have any questions. Like I said, I'm very happy to take questions, but also hear from you, you all on experience of um, how you, you you have used data in your own in your own work. All right, thank you so much for that. There was a lot of good examples there too. Um, I think, so while we wait, you guys can pull in your questions. And in the meantime, I, I have a few. So I think one of the things that happens sometimes, I know that when people want, marketers want to use that internal data and they get pushback. They're like, well, that's our secret sauce. Or like, we don't want to give all that away. That's only for customers, right? That's only for clients. And I think in, in y'all's case, that's not an inconsequential thing. I mean, people do pay you for this research. So like, how do you decide like what to give away and like what to hold back, like only for customers or only like what goes to prospects, what goes to customers, like what what's your strategy there? And also like how do you talk about it with the people who don't want to give away the <laughs> don't want to give away the info? Yeah, I mean, that was like a question that I talked about when I joined Aon with my boss at the time and and just thinking through um Luckily, the philosophy on our marketing team is like an understanding that content marketing needs to be telling good stories. It needs to be kind of like audience first type of content um, to be convincing and so uh, and, and to attract followers. So I think there, there definitely was a common understanding. Now, yes, there was a more conservative approach within the business. And I think that's evolved over time. But yeah, that like, this is just for clients, why would we give any bit of it away? And I think that's where kind of the example of compensation data versus, you know, raw data versus percentages mm -hmm. um, is something that we grappled with, because it is our bread and butter to say, like, how are you being paid? How are other people being paid? Um, and we don't want to give those numbers out. And a large part of that is just that there are a lot of qualifiers that, you know, for somebody that isn't um, a compensation professional, and lives in that, like they wouldn't understand the questions to even ask to know what that number meant um, or means. So that's where using percentages, like a software engineer in the Bay Area makes 10% more than somebody in Austin, for example, um, versus they make 150,000, you know, versus this much. And like, yeah, but you also need to understand how many, you know, employees does that company have? So mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, if you have support from your marketing leadership team, and I think it just goes back to saying this is what a quality piece of content should do. It should provide um, credibility and evidence, especially for certain topics like um, like we're talking about uh, within Aon. Um, so you have that backing. And then I think that makes it easier to go to the business and say, like, and once you produce some of that content and you can show that it gets certain page views and interest um, kind of supports your your message. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another question I got was actually about how you decide what assets to use. And I think there's a related question here too, just about infographics. Like what mm -hmm. does your decision tree look like when you're like, okay, this is a white paper. Um, mm -hmm. This is a guide. This is an infographic. This is an article. Um, Cause you know, you've got all of these possibilities, right? I think you're there, you've got all these ingredients, you've got this data, you got, you can create content, you can put it in all these different formats. Like how do you decide like, what's the right format for that audience and that purpose? Yeah, I think by and large, um, I, I tend away from large white papers, but I do think they serve a purpose. 
Um, I mentioned that we had been working on some for this year within the human capital team. You know, we were kind of bringing together our talent assessment business, our rewards business, our analytics business, bringing everything together under um, more of a, a human capital umbrella. So what are we, you know, we asked ourselves, what are the big picture as we want to tell that human capital story? Um, what are some of the big picture issues that are that we can bring value to our clients on? And so that um, kind of helped inform uh, campaigns uh, globally. Um, and so the foundation was really getting the business to talk to each other to create these white papers and then creating regional webinars, um, other campaign content, demand campaigns. So it was like, it was a bigger picture. The first step was creating that white paper. So I do think there is um, a need sometimes for deeper dive long form content. And I think there's an appetite for it. And it also depends on how it's displayed and delivered, right? Like it needs to be interactive where there's a way that people can skip around. Like they're not going to read it cover to cover. We know that. Um, but I do think that like two to four page articles are our bread and butter. And that's where um, it's, it's sustainable. You can get it out quicker um, and create that like constant drumbeat of content um, and reach that top of the funnel you know, awareness. So that's what we tend toward. Um, but, I, you know, if you have like we do a lot of data, infographics are great for that. Um, mm -hmm. And you don't even have to have that much data if you have messages that can supplement like one data point, and here's a paragraph about what this means. Um, so I think there's like a misconception that infographics have to be super technical and data heavy, and they Did don't. You question? Did you see Risa's question here? Yeah, I was gonna ask that. Like, what if you don't have that much data? <laughs> oh, I, didn't, I actually did not see that question, but- Oh gosh, yeah. yeah, no, whatever she said, I would tell me using a lot of data to illustrate some yeah. of these infographics. I know they're data heavy. Can you give me some advice on taking an existing article and making a good infographic with the data that was in the article? Like, you know, she totally, yeah. I, thought, I thought for sure you had seen that. Yeah, like, yeah. but that's, that's exactly right. I mean, that is what we think about all the time, right? Like, how can we get more leverage out of this piece of content? And a lot of times you can pull out um, four steps to, like, whatever it might be, right? And you create a really cool visual around that and then just have, like, a paragraph under each step um, and a call to action. And that's, like, an, an easy infographic. They don't have to all be... Um, or shattering analysis that you you know people have never thought of before. Um, it's great if they can be, but they don't have to be. Yeah. I think another comment here that Samuel made, and I'm I'm going to toss this out there because I think that this is this is something I've been thinking about a lot too. He said deeper content is also very useful for PR purposes, and it's a collaborative product. And when he said collaboration, one of the things I thought about you talked about the value of doing the big research report. Yeah. I think that sometimes the real value is internal. It is, it is the fact that the process, like the fact that we produce the white paper, like you need a deliverable, you need something or else people don't think there's a point to what they're doing. But I find that it's often about the messaging, like the process itself and getting everybody to think about what is, I think you and I've had a lot of, you know, a lot of phone calls. We said, well, but what is our perspective on this? Mm -hmm. And if you have two consultants on the call, then you have two perspectives. <laughs> And then if you had five and then you're there for an hour to have, I mean, you just got to let them duke it out, right? It's like you're just sort of facilitating and it's like, that's the value to me half the time in the big asset. And then it makes it easy for us to break it down into what the actual like reader wants. Totally. Do you agree yeah. with that? Like, do you disagree? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think our job is to facilitate that conversation, but also keep people in line with like the ultimate goal mm -hmm. or it could go on forever and they can talk mm -hmm. philosophically about it, which is interesting, but it doesn't accomplish the ultimate goal. I would also say our point of view papers that we produce in 2021 were all with a global point of view. But what we found is that it also varied a lot regionally. And so that's where when we put out the paper, we put... Um, a nod to that in there, but then we created, and we're still in the process of creating spinoff content, like, um, you know, blog style articles or mm -hmm. infographics or, you know, shorter pieces of content, maybe a video about what this means in APAC or what this means in Europe and, you know, South America, whatever. I mean, just regionalize it or even by um, industry in some cases, like one industry might approach this and be dealing with this completely differently. So we do want to acknowledge that, but you can't cover everything in a white paper, um, you know, one piece of content, which is why the, the spinoff pieces are valuable. 
All right. Well, then we are ending right on time. Thank you, Kristen. So now let's all get ready. I believe our next session up, we've got Albert coming from Oracle. Tom will be leading that one. So let's all hop over. We're going to talk about storytelling and language and connecting with our customers, which I think is a pretty great jumping off point from what we were just discussing. <laughs> so like, how do we get all that stuff? Like, how do we actually give people what they need? from us. So awesome. Well, thank you again. Um, this was super helpful to me and very insightful. And I know it was for everybody else too. They're saying so in the comments and I'll see y'all over in the next, next session. Bye.